my name is Marianne Verhelst, and I will talk to you about efficient hardware implementations of deep neural network processing. Deep neural networks are clearly on the rise. They're emerging in many applications like AR, VR, autonomous drones, self-driving cars, and so on. Now, all these applications work basically in two phases for the neural network. First of all, we're going to train the neural network by feeding a neural network with many, many input data items, each with the corresponding correct classification labels. And through a series of backpropagation iterations, we will train the neural network to associate the correct label to every input item. Next, in a second phase, this trained neural network is used and it has, will be provided with new data to which, it has then, uh, to which it then has to associate a label. Now, this training phase typically still happens on very computationally capable platforms, servers and GPUs. The inference phase, on the other hand, has been recently been pushed more and more into embedded devices, where, of course, the energy, efficiencies of, energy efficiency is of prime concern. Now, let's take a look at how we can do that and what's basically happening in this inference phase. The neural network we use there consists out of many stacked layers of neurons. And every neuron in itself is basically a big weighted sum of and hence many multiply accumulate operations. A neural network as such has billions and billions of multiply accumulate operations. It's very important for the remainder of this talk to understand that algorithmic designers are still playing a lot with the dimensions of this neural network. They play with the depth of the network, which means the number of layers you have in the network. They play with the width of the network, which means the dimensions of every layer. And they even play with the structure of the layers and how the layers are interconnected. If we make hardware for this, we hence have to make very programmable and versatile hardware that can map networks of today and networks of the future. Now let's take a look at which, uh, what hardware platforms already exist that have this flexibility. There's a whole zoo of them out there. We don't want hand the commercial platforms. You see some of them on the right. And on the other hand, some academic publications on the left. And this is just a sample of what's available today. What you will see is that each of them tries to push, on one hand, the, the throughput of the system. So how many tera operations per second can we do? And on the other hand, it tries to push the efficiency. How many tera operations per second can we do for every watt of power consumption in my system? If we map some of the recent work numerically in this space, you see in gray the commercial solutions, or some commercial solutions. In blue, the ISSCC and VLSI publications dealing with convolutional neural network processors of 2016-17. And in red, the CNN, the convolutional neural network processors of ISSCC 2018. Now, I already want to warn you that not every operation in this dot is the same operation. So we will come back to that. Now, each of these devices here tries to push throughput and efficiency with three important pillars. First of all, they all try to reuse data as much as possible. Secondly, they try to skip operations that are not really necessary. And third of all, they try to reduce the computational precision at which they do their multiply accumulate operations. Some implementations in this graph compute in floating points, some commercial things. Many of them compute at fixed point, where the crosses are the 16-bit implementations. The triangles compute at 8 bits, and then some even compute at 4-bit or at 1-bit precision. I will come back to that. This is why not all operations in this graph are the same operations. Now, for each of these three pillars, let's see why it helps so much in terms of energy efficiency and also throughput. To understand that, I have to brief you, briefly explain you how a typical architecture of a deep neural network processor looks like. On top, you have a programmable instruction decoder because we want flexibility and programmability towards many different networks. This flexible decoder typically controls a big multiply accumulate array 
where the weighted sums effectively take place. These, weight, these multiply accumulators get their data fed from an on-chip SRAM buffer and or some off-chip DRAM storage. Because most of the time the networks are too big to fit completely in on-chip memory. It's important to note that fetching data from off-chip DRAM is orders of magnitude more expensive than going to the on-chip SRAM, which in its turn is more expensive than just running a multiply accumulate operation. If we hence want to save energy, you first and foremost have to avoid to have to go too much off-chip. And this can be done by smartly buffering parts of the data on the chip and by a good memory hierarchy. Secondly, we also want to avoid having to fetch the same data words multiple times from SRAM. So we want to fetch it once and then reuse it as much as possible in the on-chip MAC array. And this is possible because in deep neural networks, typical, typically the input data is reused across many neurons. And we can hence feed the same data words to multiple multipliers that are dealing with different neuron computations. And in convolutional neural networks, the same weights are also reused across multiple neurons. So also there, we can organize data reuse. Of course, this means you end up with highly parallel multiply accumulate structures where many multipliers are instantiated in the data path. The extreme here is the Google TPU, which had more than 65,000 multipliers. Be very, very careful. You can hardwire your neural network on your chip to get the most out of the data reuse and the data structures, but this is not smart because you lose all your versatility to map many different types of networks and the networks of the future. So that's energy efficiency that you do not want to go after. Secondly, you can skip operations that are not strictly necessary. And in deep neural networks, this is possible because many of the weights and data values turn out to be zero inside the network. And of course, if you do a multiply accumulate with zero, it's the same as doing nothing at all. So you can just skip this operation. Secondly, some implementations even try to avoid fetching the zero-valued data word from the SRAM memory by doing smart guarded fetches. And third of all, because there will be so many zeros in my SRAM buffer, the loading and unloading of it will be highly compressible. And you can make a smart DMA that encodes the data with much less bits. The third trick to increase efficiency is to play with the precision at which you do your multiply accumulate operations. Deep neural networks do not at all need floating bit precision in their computes. Many people compute in fixed point and some in 16 bit fixed point, but you can even go down to 8 bit fixed point, 4 bit and some recent work even computes with just 1 bit numbers, binary computations in binary neural networks, where it means that a multiplier just becomes an XNOR operation. This obviously saves a lot in your multiply accumulate array in terms of uh, power consumption, but it also saves a lot in your memory interfaces because now you only have to fetch weights and input data values which have much less bits per data word. So the state of the art is pushing along all these three vectors to try to boost energy efficiency boost throughput. Up to the extreme that now we recently had a 770 tera ops per watt processor for one bit computations. And you can wonder whether that's the way to go. Do we want to keep pushing for more and more tera ops per watt as the holy grail? Well, the answer is no. Because if you do that, you sometimes start to do it at the expense of the efficiency at the system level, which at the end is what cares. So this is a very hardware-centric point of view to just push teraops per watt and teraops. And let me illustrate you this with a very simple example. Deep neural networks can be trained with various network depths and network widths. And what you see in the graph on the left here is that on one hand we have the error rate, and here we have the complexity of the network in terms of the number of operations it needs. So very deep and wide network needs a lot of computations, but has very low error rates. For the same task, CIFAR 10 here, I can also train a small network which will have a larger error rate. 
Now, this is for a floating point network. I can do the same for a fixed point network with 8 bits of precision, 4 bits, or even binary computations in my multiply accumulate arrays. And what you see is to get the same precision in a binary net, I have simpler operations, but I need many, many more operations, wider and deeper networks. Now, what's the most energy efficient solution? Well, it depends. You will need an energy model of your processor that knows how much a multiply accumulate and a memory fetch consumes in function of this number of bits to figure that out. And if you use such an energy model, you get a graph like this, where we now plot the error rate of the task, CIFAR 10 here, in function of the total system level energy. And what you then see is that floating point is not the most optimal solution. But binary nets are not either. The optimum is in between around 4-bit computation for this particular task. Now, the optimum tends to shift from task to task, going to larger number of bits for more complex tasks. This shows that you really have to focus at the system level to find your more en most energy efficient solution. And we'll need flexible hardware to basically make sure we can adapt to the most energy efficient sweet spot of an application. So to conclude, on one hand, hardware designers with a hardware-centric view are really pushing for the teraops and the teraops per watt by doing these three tricks that I discussed. On the other hand, application and algorithm designers are typically trying many algorithmic tricks to condense the network as much as possible and has a, has, have as few megabytes of weights in my memory for a given accuracy by playing with pruning the network, by playing with the topology of the network, and so on. What matters at the end is what system level efficiency I get out of there. How much energy do I consume to do a certain inference task at a given accuracy across a versatile set of benchmarks? This is what we should strive for. But it means the hardware part has to work together and co-optimize with the algorithmic part. And we hardware designers will have to make versatile, flexible platforms which can adapt to the sweet spot of energy efficiency that will vary from task to task. If we go after this together, we can make the next leap in energy efficient embedded deep learning platforms. I went through this topic, of course, rather fast. But if you want to probe deeper and you're interested, here you can find a whole list of references that explain this in much more details. Thank you for your attention.